Okay, hi, welcome. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started here. Um, as usual, I don't have anybody yet uh, showing up in person, but I do, this seems like um, most of all of you are at least checking these out after the fact. So um, kind of as some reminders here. Um, so this is our last week. We, we are to our last week or last unit of stuff. Um, as is usual for these five-week classes, uh, we actually finish up on Thursday. Don't ask me why they didn't make it just Friday or something, but that's the way it is. And uh, and yeah, I do have to have everything submitted by Thursday that you want to have evaluated. So that does mean that our schedule is a little bit shortened this week. So, you know, just keep that in mind. You do have to um, have the problem set as usual is due on Tuesday. Um, and I left the program assignment due on Thursday as usual, but we do have to have the, the test also done by Thursday. So the, the final test on, on um, our unit five will be open on Wednesday. So you can take any time on Wednesday or Thursday. So um, in any case, you know, do you make certain that you keep that in mind? Um, it would be a good idea for most people to get started on the program assignment today and try to get it done by, say, Wednesday or something so that you could um, have the, um, 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 uh, the, the day Thursday to finish up the test five. So. Um, so as usual, if anybody has questions or things, just uh, um, shout them out or chat it out. So. Um, Basically, I was planning on, I might say something about, we didn't get back the test four answers. Um, so let me bring that up real quickly. We'll do that. And then I'll look at the, the next problem set as usual. Um, and then we'll get started on the, uh, the program assignment as well today. So, um, so there is an example solution. Um, I, I actually, I don't think I have much to say about this. Uh, again, you know, people, if, if you have questions about these, let me know or email them to me. <laughs> Excuse me. Most people had the first question correct, uh, either correct or completely incorrect. One or two people were still completely incorrect. I mean, the only probably real common mistake was still not really doing these the way that I think that they're quite right, calculating the page faults, right? So, so again, once again, for these questions, there were like 10 page references, but the first three page references uh, would actually call cause page placements because there's empty frames in memory. So we just end up getting memory, um, uh, the pages three, two, four placed into frames one, two, and three in memory for all these questions. Uh, so I marked those as P's here. Um, if you're going to use, if you're going to calculate the, the page fault ratio and use both the placements and the replacements, so use all 10 of these reference, you need to count these as faults or instead of, um, instead of hits, right? So I, I had some people give me, you know, like two out of 10 here, which is definitely incorrect, right? It's either two out of seven if you only consider the replacements um, or um, it's, it's uh, uh, five out of 10 where you have to consider these, um, uh, these, initial three is false. Um, so that was probably the only kind of common problem on this first one here. Um, and then I will just mention um, that, um, again, most people either got this all correct or um, Kind of went off the rails immediately. So you know, if if you had problems on this one, you should definitely look at the example solution. So uh, I, I kind of think the modified clock is is you know kind of the most important one to understand of the page replacement schemes from our unit four because real operating systems use something like this, like this modified clock. So it'll it'll take it'll use a clock algorithm and it'll take into account both use bit and whether the page is dirty or not, whether the page has been modified or not. So, so you know, if you look at what Linux is using and Windows is using to do actual page replacement for the memory manager, um, it's gonna be something like this kind of a clock algorithm. So. All right, so yeah, that's, that's all I wanted to say about the, the test four, uh, unless there's any questions on that. Um, and um, as usual, um, let's look at the problem set 
a little bit as well, although I probably don't have a lot to say about the problem set today, um, unless there's some questions about it. Um, so problem set five, um, basically, you know, so our unit five, we're talking about uh, job scheduling. Um, so the problem set is you have to do some job scheduling by hand for the first question and also the, the third question. I'll talk about, I'll talk about those two first. Um, and then our programming assignment, we're going to be building um, a simulation of, of a job scheduler that can do different sorts of um, scheduling uh, schemes. So, you know, uh, first come, first serve and round robin and uh, the, the ones that we talk about here. So, um, So for the first question, uh, you're, you're given a set of processes and their arrival times. Um, this, this was, you know, a question from our, uh, the, the textbook, you know, from the questions at the end of chapter nine, probably. So the format's a little bit different than the um, problems, um, the, the scheduling algorithms that were given in our textbook. So hopefully these won't um, um, confuse you, but yeah, the, the, instead of giving like the, the total time for the process, uh, uh, would give you a burst time here, but it works pretty much in the same way. Although kind of as the side here, um, you know, something that you should understand, like, like in a real um, operating system that's doing multi-programming, uh, normally some version of a round robin scheduler is gonna be happening. So really what, what's kind of important is the burst time. So that's, that's really the time between when you schedule the process and when it next does some sort of IO. Right. Um, so things that have a, a short burst time means that it does just a very few number of operations before it does something that causes usually something like a read or a write to a hard drive or something like that. Um, so, so, you know, things that are short here are going to be examples of things that are um, um, IO bound. So, so they do relatively small amount of work uh, in comparison to when they have to actually do some reads or write to get data. Uh, in and out of memory or, or um, to secondary storage, things like that. <laughs> Whereas things that have large burst times are representative of processes that um, are compute bound, right? So if, um, I mean, and you can have processes that are even more um, extreme than this. You can have processes that really don't have to do any IO at all, maybe until they've done their calculation. So they can actually go minutes or hours uh, just using the data that's uh, in memory. So, so once you've got the data loaded um, into memory to be used, um, a compute bound process doesn't need to load anything else. Um, but those, those are um, typically um, gonna have high burst times in a round robin system, All right? So anyway, though, you know, um, in terms of this problem, the first one, uh, you can think of these, these work kind of the same as the service times that we use to um, work through these uh, scheduling algorithms that we had in chapter nine. Um, although we also did give a process priority here. So um, um, I asked you to use that for one of these. So basically you need to do, uh, you're given kind of an example of doing first come first serve. So if you remember first come first serve is basically just keep a common queue. First come first serve is non-preemptive the way our textbook shows it. So um, since process one came in first at time zero, it's going to be scheduled. Um, so it'll run for the first 60 milliseconds, the first 60 time steps. Um, and then process two, the, the next process that came in was process two, and it came in at time 20. But, you know, since this is non-preemptive, uh, we don't schedule another process till process one is done. So process two runs next, and then three. So they just run in the order that they came, right? But uh, so the the what you should give me um, for this first problem problem for the problem set is the the same sort of answer. So I, what I want to see is like a schedule, um, and then the time broken up into ten millisecond uh, steps um, that each process is running here. Right. So the first one you should do is the shortest remaining time. So shortest remaining time is one of the process scheduling algorithms uh, that we look at um, in chapter nine. Uh, uh, so we've got uh, shortest process next and shortest remaining time. Shortest process next is kind of a non-preemptive 
version of doing scheduling algorithm based on um, the, the, the time of the process and shortest remaining time is sort of the preemptive version, okay? So in our textbook, um, the preemption happens when a new process arrives. So anytime a new process arrives, you then uh, preempt the current running process um, and then you select the process that has the shortest remaining time left on it to be the next process to run, okay? So for, yeah, for this one, that'll mean that um, actually at time 20, you know, process one will start running, but at time 20, um, you would preempt process one. At that point, you would have process two and process one, and you'd make a decision, which is the, the process with the shortest time left. And that would be the one that would start running um, from time 20 there. Um, so the, the third one is, is a, uh, scheduling algorithm that our book doesn't really use. Uh, our textbook talks about the feedback scheduler, which uses a kind of, um, uh, indirect, uh, priority. So, so the, the level that you get in the feedback scheduler indirectly corresponds to sort of the the priority of the process. Here, uh, you've got an explicit priority, okay? So um, even though this wasn't given in the textbook, as an example of a scheduler, hopefully, hopefully you can figure this out. So um, you should do this in a non-preemptive way. So you, you only make decisions when the current running process is done, but the decision function that's made on this is you take the one process with the highest priority, okay? So ho hopefully this isn't confusing. Here, low numbers mean higher priority. So in this case, process two has the highest priority among these. So, so if all four of these processes were ready to run, process two would be considered to be the, the one to run next, having the highest priority. Process four has the next highest pri priority, then process three, and then process one has the lowest priority. That's what we mean by the, the smaller priority number implies the higher priority here. So, um, and then the final one is to do a round robin, uh, which is an example of a preemptive process scheduler uh, using a, uh, a system time slash quantum of 30. So ho hopefully everybody, um, well, you know, we're gonna be, uh, again, we're gonna be implementing process scheduler simulation uh, for our program assignment. Uh, but, you know, this is similar to um, actually our assignment two, we had a round robin scheduler, but, you know, our textbook talks about these. So basically here, the preemption mechanism is that every 30 milliseconds or every three of these 10 millisecond time steps, um, we would preempt the current running process, return it back to the ready queue, um, and then select the next process at the front of the ready queue, okay? So be careful that you do maintain your ready queue correctly. You know, so when something gets preempted, it should go to the back of the ready queue. Um, um, I think I've talked about this before. Um, if um, you want to, to end up with the same results that our textbook gives, there can be some ambiguity. So like uh, here, we don't have an ambiguity, but if, if process two was arriving at time 30 and process one would, would have been preempted at time 30, the way the textbook handle is, handles it is that the arriving process um, is considered first. So you'd end up putting process two on the ready queue first, followed by you'd preempt the running process and put it um, after any arriving process. So, um, so that that I can't remember if that makes a difference um, in this um, problem you had to do for this uh, problem set or not, but it might. Um, And then process, uh, uh, sorry, uh, question three was also um, about doing a process scheduling, uh, but here uh, you're asked to do process scheduling with a, a multi-CPU system. So this is a little bit from chapter 10. I believe this question comes from the, the questions on chapter 10 here. Um, but, um, but yeah, I kind of want to give this to you. I, I, there's probably a similar or the same kind of question on the, the final test. So, um, you know, you might want to make certain you understand this. So here um, you have to simulate um, a system that has two CPUs um, and we're going to do Ron Robin scheduling with a time slash quantum of three, okay? So basically what you should give me is something that looks like this, but that has 
two CPUs instead of one. So, you know, from time zero to one, um, there, there might have been um, a process running on CPU one, there might have been a process running on CPU two. So you need to have two CPUs and have which process is running on CPU one and which process is running on CPU two. Right? So in this case, this looks a little bit more like the problems in our textbook. So you're just given the arrival time and service time. Um, and you should just think of these as generic units of time. Um, Oh, and it is possible, you know, it is possible both for the first question, for this question, for the CPU to be like idle at some point. So just kind of as a hint, I mean, for at time from time zero to one, um, A arrives at time zero. So there's only one pro only one process in the system. Um, so, you know, process A can be scheduled to run on one of the two CPUs. So that's that's another thing about these. These processes are not multi-threaded, um, so you can't ever have A running both on CPU one and CPU two at the same time. So that means that um, process A is gonna be running on CPU one from time zero to one, but process, but, but CPU two is gonna be idle because there's no other process um, um, uh, to run, right? So, so actually CPU two is gonna be idle from zero to one and from one to two. But then at time two, another process arrives. So maybe process B will run on the other CPU after time two there, right? So that's a, that's a hint. Uh, and, and there's there's rules given here about how to, um, you know, if you follow these, this will make it so that there's no ambiguities in the results you should be getting here. So, um, you know, if a process arrives at time T and at the same time, both CPU one and CPU two time out, you're supposed to uh, handle the newly arriving process first. So the, the so in this problem, there's one common ready queue. So the newly arriving process would go on the ready queue first, followed by the, the process that times out on CPU one would then time out and be put onto the ready queue second. Um, and then the, the, the process on CPU two, if, if they all were timing out and arriving at the same time, the, the process on CPU two would then be put on the ready queue third, according to this first rule here. Um, another rule is that yeah, you know, if both of the CPU, if, if both of the CPUs are idle at the start of a time step, CPU one will always schedule first. So that's why I said, for example, process A arrives at time zero. So at time zero, both CPU one and CPU two start off at I as idle but CPU one would schedule first. So it would schedule and run process A. And at that point, there's no more processes available on the ready queue. So CPU two would just be idle from time zero to one, right? Um, and that's a direct um, result of following this rule here, this rule two. So. Um, and, and yeah, and I just, our, discuss this one. So then that's the, the same thing as saying is when a CPU is idle, um, it will check the ready queue, uh, but it is possible that the ready queue could be empty. So, you know, if there's nothing scheduled, then the CPU is going to be idle for a second. And that can happen in this problem, right? I don't think that the CPU ever ends up being idle um, on this first one, right? I mean, it could happen, even though it's a single CPU um, that you're um, simulating here. Um, but um, but I, it probably doesn't ever happen that the CPU is idle on the first problem, but, but it definitely can happen on the second one that sometimes CPU one or CPU two ends up being idle here. So. Um, all right, and then um, just a quick word about the, the second problem here. So what I'm looking for is basically a, a, a reproduction of the figure 9.9 in the textbook, and I should have had that up here, but um, um, let me bring up that figure here real quickly. So um, um, I'm sure I talked about this in the lecture videos, but but we're talking about this discussion here where, where um, um, there was a little bit of a discussion um, about um, how you would actually calculate the shortest process and actually the shortest remaining time, right? Because uh, the difficulty is that usually in real operating systems, again, it's not so much that 
the process, um, when you start it, you, you know up front how long it's going to take. So you don't normally know what the service time is of a process. That's more for like older batching systems where you used to do it kind of that way. So what, what's more typical is that though you can figure out which things have short or long burst times by keeping a history of the process. And, and that's all that we're doing here um, is that, um, um, so like in this figure 9.9 .9 that was referenced, um, we've got a natural process. Uh, the, the last time it ran had a burst time of one. And then the next time it ran, it took you know two units of time between when it started and when it had to do IO. So this is really the burst time, right? And the burst time is changing. So one way you can you can um, decide what its um, service time is, is is we can estimate what its burst time is, um, and then we could select the next process ba based on ones that have short or long burst times, and, and that's what we're doing here when we talk about exponential averaging, right? We're, we're talking about ways of estimating um, what we would expect the um, burst time to be given a history, right? So you can do like a simple average. So, so that's what this is, but but this the, the, the point of this figure is that simple averaging is a bit naive. Um, it can take quite a, a lot of time, right? So, so if the burst time is, is getting longer and longer, uh, in a short amount of time. And if you just do a simple average, so here, this this point is just a simple average of all the burst times that occurred, you know, for the first four time units, right? And that, that's our estimate of what it is, but, but it lags quite a bit um, if you're doing a simple average, right? So it's not a good estimate is, is what the point is if, if you read the textbook here, right? So it's much, more um, common to use like a windowed average, right? So something simpler than these exponential averages is we could just use the last two or last three, take the average of the last two burst times, right? That would be a simple windowed average, right? Um, now the exponential average then um, um, is a little bit more complex, but not too much more. So to do an exponential average, um, you just have to apply this formula here, or well, this one here, right? So basically, the the you estimate the burst time at the next time step in plus one. Uh, um, so, like if your alpha is 0.5, um, so 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 here it was showing an exponential average with an alpha of 0.5. That's the white, the uncolored circles, and an, uh, an alpha of 0.8. That was the colored in circles here. Um, so if um, so like if your alpha is 0 0.5, you would just um, to, to make your next estimate, you would take 0 0.5 times the previous um, burst time, the, the time at, 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 at time in, right? Plus one minus that. So again, if alpha is 0 0.5, one minus alpha is also 0 0.5 times what the previous estimate was, your last estimate at time S of n, all right? So anyway, you know, in order to be able to calculate these for the second question, you have to understand this is an example of a um, of um, a, a, a discrete um, 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 uh, recurrence relationship. So, but yeah, the way this works is that you know, if the the larger alpha is, the more weight you're given to the previous. Um, time step in your estimate of your, your estimate of what the next burst time will be, right? So that's why, you know, the, the, the 0.8 alpha where alpha is higher um, is a little bit faster um, at getting to the uh, estimate here because you're using much more, a, a larger weight of the previous burst time in your estimate of what the, the next burst time will be, right? And if alpha is lower, it'll take a bit longer to respond, right? Um, and if alpha is really small, uh, you know, if alpha goes down to zero, it becomes basically a, a simple average. Um, so. Anyway, um, so that's what I'm looking for, um, basically a kind of a re, 
creation of that figure 9.9 here for the, the second problem, but with these burst times, okay? So unlike one thing here, one final hint on this, the two examples in part A and B, given the, the actual process was either always increasing until it came to a threshold or it started out big and was always decreasing until it came to some point where it settled down, right? Uh, for the problem that you're given here, it actually um, um, kind of wiggles around a little bit before then increasing, right? So the figure is going to be a little bit more complex than either the A or the B um, here in terms of how the um, simple average and how the exponential averages would track um, uh, the, the changes that you're seeing here. So, All right, um, I think that um, that was kind of all I wanted to discuss about the problem set. Anybody want to ask, bring up anything about this written problem set here? If not, we'll go ahead and uh, kind of as usual, um, I'll get started on the program assignment. Um, so let's look here. So this one is pretty similar to the previous program assignment, um, although it's a little bit more open-ended for the last steps. So as usual, um, I'll go ahead and um, accept this assignment from scratch and we'll talk about the, the tasks here. So let me go ahead and um, let's close that one off. But let me go ahead and start from the beginning, um, accepting the assignment and then cloning the repository. Um, yeah, question about program assignment four. We're kind of done with four, but after I'm done with this um, um, help session today, you can um, ask me about four. So. Uh, but we'll only be about 20 more minutes here, I think, um, finishing up uh, or getting started on the assignment five here. So, um, so once we've accepted it, as usual, we should be able to clone the SSH um, URL here. Oops. Uh, let me get um, GitHub started or get VS Code started. So we'll paste in our SSH URL for the assignment five. Uh, oh, as usual, I always have this problem. I don't know if people have this one, but it's kind of a little bit of a bug in VS Code. So yeah, if you close off from a uh, dev container, uh, it doesn't give you the option to clone it into a local folder. So I always have to instead do like a um, open up a folder from my local first before I can actually clone the way I want it to. So I'll just open up an old folder first and close that off again. So let's try it again. So we'll clone that URL again. Um, but yeah, after you do that, usually then it gives you the option to clone it into a local folder instead of uh, into a dev container. So as usual, I'm gonna clone that into my repos directory. Um, oh, I'm probably already having an assignment five here. Um, uh, just a second, I want to delete that off first before I reclone it. All right, there we go. That's better. So we'll go ahead and clone it um, to our local folder. Uh, we'll go ahead and open up the clone repository, and then we'll go ahead and reopen it in our dev container. Uh, 
Um, and then as usual, you know, you should make certain that uh, I got all the stuff open here. If that's the first time you're doing the assignment, it probably shouldn't have anything open for you normally, but um, um, I'll go ahead and make certain that um, everything builds and cleans, uh, uh, builds and runs the test um, correctly. So we'll do a make clean, filed by build. Um, you know, you, you just want to always be checking that um, everything's building um, and it links into the test and uh, sim executables. Um, and that uh, then the um, test should run then, um, oops, there we go both from the terminal or if you want to run it from the test container. So in this case, there were there was one uh, um, set of tests that was uncommented to begin with. So, um, so for this assignment, and you know, I'll go ahead and also create the first issue um, as you usually should do. So on this um, assignment, there's actually kind of five tasks, uh, like the previous assignment are, are basically completing off some uh, missing member methods in the scheduling system. And then uh, after that, you do have to implement an additional scheduling policy. This one's a bit more open-ended though than the last one. So I give you a choice or, or I, let, I leave it up to you. So you can pick the scheduling policy, but you do need to imp implement a, a new one um, um, once you get the, the um, basic scheduling system working here. So. So anyway, uh, create the first issue and go ahead and um, associate it then with the feedback pull request. All right, so... Um, Like I said, um, I'm, I, I might be quicker than I've usually been because by this point, most people should be familiar with kind of what you need to do. So for task one, there are some missing uh, functions. This is meant to be a little bit of a warm up. Although if you get all of task one working uh, and implemented, that gets you like 50%, ha half of the points for the assignment here. But yeah, for this assignment, uh, you have to implement the get system time, get number processes, is CPU idle? and get writing process name. The first two are, are relatively simple. Um, there are member variables called system time and num processes. So you just have to simply return those. The other two, you have to use the, the CPU um, member variable um, to implement those. Um, so, oh, and kind of like, like for assignment four, um, uh, the, this first task was actually, broken up into four little subtasks. So you have task one, one, task one, two, one, three, and one, four. So you can do these one by one. So, so, you know, so I'll give you the first one. So to get the system time, uh, you just need to implement the get system time here as a member method. Um, so in this assignment, you're given the um, um, scheduling system um, class is in the scheduling system header file. So the get system time is simply going to be a member method that um, doesn't take any parameters input, a constant member method to, since it's a getter function, um, and it should return the um, current um, system time, which is just uh, defined as an integer uh, this time for this class here. So it's going to return an integer, right? Uh, but as usual, um, or the same as in the last assignment, um, this method is completely missing. So you have to add it into the header file. Um, and then we have to implement it. So, um, you know, again, I encourage you, uh, it's usually kind of a common style thing that the order that these are declared in the header file should be the same order that they end up in the uh, implementation file. So since I added this getter method after the get running PID, um, I want to find that method and go ahead and put 
our new getter method right after it. Um, and you know, you do have to define the function documentation. Um, and this shouldn't be an afterthought, so you should add this in when you are uh, actually creating the method. Right, but but yeah, these first two are simply just uh, returning uh, are just returning the current values of these uh, member methods here. Uh, and I did forget that this is a member of the scheduling system. So uh, you do uh, in the implementation file, you do have to indicate that this is a member method of the scheduling system class that we're implementing here. So this is an accessor method to get and return the um, current system time. Um, and it takes no parameters, so there's no at param tags, uh, but it does return, it's a value returning function. So you have to have at returns documentation. Um, if you have lines that are continued, you know, keep lines less than 80 characters. Another comment in general I've been given to people. So I've, I've got my settings so that shows both the 80 and the 120 column mark here in, in my uh, Visual Studio Code editor. But if you have long continued lines, you should uh, indent continued lines in additional two spaces and so on, right? Um, but you know, something like that should be enough to get the system time to work. So um, now that I uncommented that, if I rerun my tests, um, it should be passing all the uh, uh, tests, task one test for getting the system time, actually just this one insertion here. Um, so you need to do a similar thing for the get number of processes. Um, is CPU idle, should return a Boolean, uh, should return true if the current CPU is idle and false if it's not. Okay, so this, um, um, we're using uh, something pretty much the same as what we did for the second programming assignment in this class. So there is a member variable called CPU, um, which just holds a, a PID, which is just a type def for an int, right? So this holds, just holds a process identifier. Uh, and we use minus one as a special process identifier to represent idle. So whenever the CPU is idle, the CPU member variable um, is going to be set um, to idle, right? So to, to implement the is CPU idle, you, you can check if the CPU member variable is equal to the idle flag, um, you know, that global constant. And if it is, you want to return true. And if it's not, that means that there is a valid process running, right? You know, so process ID one, two, three, whatever the process, whatever the ID of the return around process will be in there um, if there's actually a process running on the CPU. And in that case, you'd want the is CPU idle to return um, um, false, right? But anyway, so to implement that one, you have to check the CPU member variable, um, but this does return a Boolean instead of an int result. Um, and this one, the get running process, the last one for task one, um, you need to return back the running process name so uh, again, just a, a quick kind of explanation of what ha of what we're doing here. So this is similar to what we did for the second programming assignment in this class. We've got an actual, um, uh, we're just using an array instead of a map this time of processes. So, so there's a member variable called process. This is defined to be a process pointer, but this gets dynamically allocated. So, you know, when we're running these, um, simulations, um, there's going to be an input file like process table one.sim. So this is the same uh, process table that was used at the examples in our textbook in chapter nine, right? So pro there, there's five processes that we're simulating in this scheduling uh, simulation. Process A arrives at time three, has a service time, arrives at time zero and has a service time of three. Then B arrives at two with a service time six and so on. So, so these are basically the name of the process, uh, when it arrives and it's total time, it's service time here. Um, um, 
so basically when we load the simulation uh, um, or well, we lo when we load the process table, it loads in one of those files, but you know, that's gonna be the place where it sets the number of processes. So that's based on the number of processes that we're gonna simulate for this scheduling simulation, right? But the other thing is that this process table gets dynamically allocated. So, so this really is gonna be an array where we use dynamic allocation, the dynamic memory allocation to allocate an array of these process structures. So the, so the process structure is declare is defined um, in the same file here in the scheduling system header file, right? So again, if you're not familiar with that from the previous assignments, what that means in practical terms is that um, if if you have like um, a process identifier like PID. So valid process identifiers start at zero. So negative one means idle, but zero is the first valid process identifier in this assignment. But you can use that as an index in the process table. All right. So once you index in the process table, um, then each one of these is an instance of one of these process structures. So then you can access each of these member variables. It's process identifier, the name, arrival time, service time, right? So process zero, uh, if we were loading this process table, is going uh, to is going to correspond with the process that has a name of A. So this will be process zero, this will be process one, two, three, uh, and four, you know, these five processes. Uh, it's arrival time for process zero with the name of A will be, at, arrival time will be zero, and its service time will be three, right? So that's, you know, the name is A, arrival time is zero, and the service time is three, and so on. Right. If you want to access, you can access any of those. So like if I want to get the arrival time, I can access the arrival time. These are all public um, member variables of the structure, right? So, so I can access all those by just using a member access, right? So if I want to get the arrival time, but in particular for the get the process name, you want you know, given the process identifier, you want to look that up in the process table and get the process name, right? That's, that's, that's a string that holds the name of the process, uh, which would be like A um, for this process table that we're trying to simulate here. Or process one would have a name of B and so on, right? Um, But yeah, you'll need to, to be able to do that because you'll need to be able to access the process table for most of the other functions that you do as well here. So, um, but uh, yeah, that's that's the first four tasks. And then I'm just going to kind of talk about the others. And then I want to kind of get started discussing the uh, today. I won't, I won't go into big detail of it, but I want to get started talking about the, the second half of the assignment here. Excuse me. Um, so besides implementing those accessor methods, uh, the next one you have to implement is the all processes done. So basically what you need to do is you have to search through that process table, right? So you need to use the process table and the number of process variables to create a loop that checks uh, for each one of those processes. If it's done, if you find a process that is not done, you want to return false because all processes done should re return a Boolean result to return true if all processes have been marked as done in the table and return, return false if one or more processes are currently marked as not done, right? Um, and, you know, again, for that one, um, like I was just showing, um, you'll need to use the process table, um, you know, and, and you know the number of processes in the process table from number of processes, uh, member variable. Uh, but in that case, um, there's a Boolean called um, um, in the process, there's a Boolean called um, um, done. <laughs> there is the, the last one here. So this should this will start off as false. All the processes initially will not be done. So that will be false. But uh, you can check that member variable um, and to see if you can find a process that's not done yet or not. So for the all processes done here. Um, And then dispatch CPU if idle um, is used in the simulation. This is the main thing that's called 
in the main loop of the simulation that if the CPU is idle, um, it will um, try and dispatch a process. So this is part of doing the, the process scheduling simulation, okay? But we really don't use uh, the, the, um, um, the we, we, we implement um, scheduling strategies to actually do the work of determining what should be the next process that gets dispatched, okay? So for this method that you're implementing here in the scheduling system, you're, you're not really gonna be doing the work to figure out which process to dispatch. You're gonna call the, um, uh, you're gonna call the scheme to ask it to tell you which um, process to dispatch next, right? So the pseudocode for this method is, you know, you first check if the CPU is idle. Uh, you should reuse the um, is CPU idle method uh, that you implemented on task one here. I believe that's a requirement um, here. Uh, if it is idle, then you want to ask the uh, scheme uh, what should be the next process to dispatch. So it, it will return you a process identifier uh, which you would set the CPU to be that process, um, and you'd want to, you need to update the start time of that process to the current system time. Okay, so this is similar to what we did for assignment um, four. So just to explain this, um, in our scheduling systems, um, we've got a uh, it's called a policy, right? So there's a, a hierarchy of scheduling policies um, that implement things like um, um, or that can implement different scheduling policies. So the only one that you're given initially is first come first serve, but you know you could also have shortest remaining time, highest response ratio next, and so on. All these different scheduling policies could be implemented, right? Um, and the, the the scheduling policy, like in the previous one for the uh, paging uh, policy or the paging scheme, um, this the, the scheduling policy is just an abstract base class that defines an API. Um, so these are the things that you have to implement uh, in order to implement a particular concrete scheduling policy. You know, so you have to be able to um, be notified when a new process arrives. You have to be able to the, the one that we're talking about here uh, for scheduling um, um, for dispatching the CPU if it's idle is you have to call the dispatch uh, method for the policy, right? So dispatch doesn't take any parameters as input and it returns the process identifier of the process that should be selected to run next. So that's the heart of, of, of scheduling a process is, is the dispatch method, determining what should be the next process that's dispatched, right? Um, So that means here, uh, if it's not clear, that basically you have to call the dispatch method for your policy, right? So for for uh, dispatch CPU of idle, um, somewhere in your code, since you've got the policy, the policy is a pointer to an instance of the scheduling policy. You have to call dispatch, and that returns a process identifier. Right, so since it returns the process identifier, you, you ask whatever the policy is um, that, that's being run by your simulation to make a dispatching decision. It returns the, the PID of the next process that it determines should be scheduled to run next. And then you remember that and you do the things that are um, um, said here, right? So you update the CPU to be that process and then you um, update the process table um, that, you know, if, if this process was never run before, you need to set the start time. And so you have to record uh, the first time this process actually started running on the CPU. So, um, Uh, and then finally, um, um, the fourth one you need to do is to implement the check process finished. This is a little bit, some similarities to the, the all processes done. Um, 
And that's not true. Um, so so the, the, the purpose of this one is that if there is a process currently running on the uh, CPU, uh, uh, this method is supposed to be checking to see if it's finished, if, if it's actually run to completion, right? So basically, if the CPU is idle, that means that there's no process running on it, so there's nothing to do. So, so the suggested pseudocode for this is, you know, if CPU is idle, you, you should use your is CPU idle method to check that. So if it is idle, you just return immediately. Um, and then uh, make a second check. So if the process that's running, if it's time used is less than its service time, then it's not yet done. So again, you should return immediately, okay? So again, that that is, um, um, uh, you're back to looking at the process table. So you know which process is currently running because that's in the CPU member variable. You can use that to access the process table. Inside of the process table for a process, you've got um, its service time. So that's the total amount of time it needs to run. Um, and you've got its uh, time used, it's used at time. Um, that's the amount of time it's actually used so far. So if, if the use time is less than the service time, um, then um, um, it's not yet done. If the use time is greater or equal to the service time, then it's done. If, and if, if you find that it is done, you have to basically record some things. Record uh, the time when, in the system when the process finished. You have to set the process to be done. So you have to actually set that Boolean so that your uh, check all process finishes works correctly. All process done works correctly um, here because it's using that, that done member variable. This is where it gets set. Um, and then you have to set the CPU back to idle. So when the process is done, the CPU becomes idle then again at that point. All right. Um, and then once you do that, you actually do have to uncomment some things in the run simulation to get the full simulations to work. Again, this was kind of the same as what you did for the previous assignment. So uh, I think, uh, but unlike the previous side, there's only like one place. So run simulation is the main loop. Um, so let's look at the scheduling system uh, implementation file um, and look at the run simulation. So this, this is the thing that actually implements the loop. So here's the main loop, it's commented out. So you have to uncomment that. So basically what it does is while, as long as not all processes are done, we have to keep simulating stuff. What we do to simulate stuff is we check if a process arrives, uh, check if we need to preempt um, the current running process, um, you know, so this, uh, we asked the, the policy whether we should preempt or not um, in order to implement the check process preemption. Call your dispatch CPU of idle. So if the CPU is currently idle, we want to try and dispatch a process, the next running process. Simulate a CPU cycle, which basically implements the, the, the time use and stuff like that. Uh, and then we call your check process finish that you implemented, that you should implement at, at, as task four, uh, which, figure out if the process that's currently running is done. And if it is, records that it's done, does all that kind of stuff. So, and we just keep doing that until all the processes are done, right? That's our main loop for the simulation here. Um, all right, and then kind of as a, a final thing, I, I did, you know, I'll talk more about this on Wednesday, um, although I hope, Again, most people get an early start this time and, and that you try and get finished up by Wednesday, you know, so you should should definitely be started, if not mostly finished by Wednesday. But um, um, let, me, let me, because of that, though, let me go ahead and, and kind of get you started on this. So the the, the last task six or the, the, the things after task five is really more open ended, uh, but you have to, what you're required to do is to implement um, a, um, a scheduling policy of your own. Oh, I see my documentation is wrong there. Uh, you're actually implementing a scheduling policy of your choice, not, not a page replacement scheme. That was the previous um, assignment there. So you're given first come first serve. So you can implement any of the, the scheduling policies that are talked about in our textbook. So the ones besides first come first serve. So the ones talked about were um, the, you know, the round robin scheduler, source process next, source main time, um, highest response ratio next, um, or like a feedback scheduler, right? Um, so, uh, 
I kind of talk about in general what you would have to do to do that, right? So basically what I have to do is you, you first have to create a new file for the policy that you want to run and get it added to, to the build system. That's what um, um, kind of this first step is. Then you have to actually implement those four API methods, reset policy, preempt, new process, and dispatch. Um, and then finally, you have to enable um, the, the your new um, scheduling policy in the fuller simulation. Okay. So um, let's say that you wanted to implement um, a feedback scheduler, okay? Um, so to do that, you would, what I suggest is, I mean, basically you have to add in a new scheduling policy.cpp file and a new scheduling policy.hpp file into the system. Now these files for your new scheduling policy are gonna be pretty similar to the existing first come first serve. So probably what you wanna do is just copy and paste these. So um, you can use the uh, file browser in Visual Studio Code, or you could use your um, uh, file browser on your, um, um, on your host system, um, whatever the normal file browser is that you use to do these, right? Um, so in, in Visual Studio Code, I think you can just hit like, if I, if I select the file over here in the file browser, the file explorer, I can do like control C and control V as usual, make a copy of that file. Um, and then once you have a copy, um, you need to rename it. So let's say we're gonna do a feedback scheduler. So I hit F2 to rename. Uh, oops. Um, uh, use those kind of um, uh, abbreviations. So SPN, SRT, here I'm, I'm just using feedback, FB as an example, um, but, but the name should be correct. So it should be feedback, FB scheduling policy, right? Um, likewise, we would need a copy of the implementation file for our feedback schedule if that's what we wanted to add. I'll do control C, control V. And we'll rename the file, right? Uh, but when you do that, of course, I mean, you know, even though you made a new file with that name uh, inside of the contents after you copy it, it's still the first come first serve. Uh, so you do have to, you wouldn't be able to compile until you at least change the name of the class. But probably the best thing to do is to do like a, a global search and replace. So I think like in, in Visual Studio Code, if you do like control F, um, you can bring up the, the thing. So um, you, you wanna be a little bit careful here, watch what you're doing, but uh, basically I do want to um, find all the, the inst uh, in all the instances of FCFS scheduling policy and replace those with FB feedback scheduling as an example here. Um, bring it back up to the first one here. So now that I've got the first one highlighted, I can go ahead and use my find and replace to replace these. Um, you should look through the documentation also, make certain the docu documentation matches. So after I change this, I won't do that here, but you know, some of this might, re might refer to the first come first serve, but you should be changing that to be whatever scheduling policy. But you know, basically you have to change the name of the class and the name of the constructors and destructors, right? There is one other thing. Um, um, if you do it the way I showed here, there, there's these um, guards for the uh, the header file in the .hpp file for the, the scheduling policy. Um, so you want to make certain you change those too, or else you'll have some compilation problems. So you should change that. All, should still all be all caps, but um, so if I'm doing FB scheduling policy, it should be FB scheduling policy. All right, um, and, and of course you have to do that also in the implementation file, same kind of thing. So, I can just do a, a search and replace. So here we're, we're changing the name of the constructors and the destructors to be our new class here, uh, the feedback scheduling policy. Uh, of course, all these are member fun functions um, for uh, our new 
scheduling policy that we're trying to add. So, so we need to change at least all of your member functions. Um, and then you can start from there. Of course, you know, now we're still implementing actually first come first serve, but you can, you know, you can look through that for some of the scheduling policies, this may or may not be a good starting point. So normally probably what you need to do is kind of remove all the code that was in there and put in your own implementation. Um, but um, once you've done that, though, you want to get this, get your new policy added into the build system. OK, so I, I've created my file that I'm going to implement my new uh, feedback scheduler uh, I've, I've, I've created here now, but it's not actually building. Uh, it's not actually part of the build system yet. You know, so if you do like a clean build, um, you'll see that. Um, uh, let me fix that error there. So um, I left in some code, for example, that I was showing there. So So, you know, you always want to make certain that you're uh, always at like a buildable state, you know, so uh, we're still compiling, but, you know, we're not really actually building the new one that I added in there until we add it into the build system. We're only building the scheduling system, the scheduling policy, and the first come first serve scheduler, right, um, to build our um, test and um, um, sim executables here. So to add it, um, I've made it relatively simple on this assignment. Um, you have to open up the make file, the main make file in the project, uh, and you'll find the only thing you should have to do, I think, um, there, there's actually code down here for the um, in the make file for the dependencies for like an HRRN and RRSPN. I guess I don't have FB. I should have put, should have put FB in there too. Um, but everything but FB actually had um, dependencies already defined. So like a, the object file for the feedback scheduler would depend on the header file. So if the header file changes, we want to re, recompile the, the, the object file. If the base class changes, we want to recompile the header file. Or if the implementation file, that's all that these are really kind of saying for all of these. So, but, but you do need to add it up here, right? So since I'm adding the feedback scheduler, um, I mean, you could just uncomment the, the appropriate line here, but you have to be careful. So uh, this variable here in the make file is actually one line, um, but we use this backslash to, to mean that we're continuing on to the next line here. So every line except for the last one has to have a backslash on these lines that, that are defining make file variables here. But um, yeah, whichever one you want to add, you can add it to the end, being careful that um, if it's the last one, it doesn't have the backslash, but everything before it does have a backslash to continue on the line there. But the important thing of that is if, if you add that, it should now build. So now, again, I'm going to go ahead and do a clean. Um, and if we do a build now, if you watch carefully, what you should see is it's not only just compiling the first come first serve scheduling policy, it's also compiling the feedback scheduling policy to an object file. And you should probably see, I mean, you definitely should see that it gets linked in. So if you look at when we link everything together to make the test executable, that new policy that I added um, is, is getting linked in there. Um, and as well as it's also getting linked in um, uh, when it makes the sim, okay? But you need to make certain that you are actually building the new one that you're adding uh, and that's getting linked into your test and sim executables right um, and this would be a good point then to um, actually commit your changes when you're starting task six so so you want to make at least you want to make a couple of commits for your task six work um, and one commit should be probably um, after you get your new file added and it's successfully building um, and your tests are still running and passing um, um, commit that work to the um, to GitHub, basically. So, um, so yeah, I mean, in my case, we'll see that um, uh, we've got new um, um, untracked files. So, so the the U indicates that the the feedback uh, scheduling policy um, hasn't been has never been added to the uh, assignment yet. But but you know. Like we've done before, you can just add those to the commit and then push them and you'll get those new files 
um, added into um, GitHub, as well as you know the changes you made to make file to add in your um, um, new scheduling policy to the build and things like that. So, um, And then just real quickly, like I said, I'll, I'll, I'll talk maybe a little bit more in detail about that. Once you get that far, then you're ready to um, actually do the work of implementing a new scheduling policy. Okay, so this is where, you know, I, mean, it, I left it more open ended, but you'll have to think about it. so whatever policy you select, you'll have to figure out how you're going to implement it. To implement it, you'll have to you have to implement these four methods um, in your new policy, the reset what happens for the reset, what happens for preempt, new process and dispatch, all right? So, you know, real quickly, just to discuss it, if I, if I look at my new, um, I look at my new feedback scheduler, uh, remember it still has the first come first serve, but um, uh, basically what, what what is implemented for um, first come first serve is uh, basically all you need is a simple ready queue, all right? So we use a, a standard template library ready queue of process identifiers. That's the only member variable that the first come first serve scheduling policy had, right? Uh, and then reset policy is called anytime a new simulation is started. So all we have to do is make certain that the ready queue is empty. So this is basically initializing the ready queue um, um, or it's creating a new empty queue and swapping that with our ready queue to make certain that the ready queue is empty, right? Um, and then new new process is called whenever a new process enters the simulation, right, for, for the policy. So for uh, first come, first serve, all you have to do is push that process uh, back to the end of the ready queue. So that, that's how we keep track of it. Um, and first come first serve is non preemptive right so basically the preempt is called every cycle of the simulation asking the policy whether I should preempt the current running process or not right so for non preemptive scheduling policies you just always return false so, so something like shortest process next which is non preemptive. Um, um, you simply return false. First come, first serve is also non preemptive. So it just returns false. But if you implement a preemptive um, scheduling policy, you have to determine okay, should the current running process be preempted or not? And I'll talk more about that maybe on Wednesday. Um, and finally, last but not least, the most important one then is the actual dispatching decision. Okay. So this is the method that's called. Um, every clock cycle of the simulation asking the policy, okay, if the CPU is idle, dispatch will get called and dispatch should be making the decision what should be the next process that's run, right? So again, for first come first serve, it's relatively simple. If there are processes waiting, so if the ready queue is not empty, we just take the process that's at the front of the ready queue um, and return that, um, uh, removing it from the ready queue. That's, that's how we dispatch for first come first serve, right? Um, and then finally, um, um, you probably will have to add a few more things to get the full simulations to run. Um, again, maybe I can talk more about this on Wednesday, uh, but um, at a minimum, you will have to um, add in your new policy. So if you go to the the main function for the assignment fund five sim, um, you'll see that there's kind of a, um, a big if else statement. So, you know, it, it, that only has first come first serve that creates a new first come first serve scheduling policy to be the policy that's used for the simulation. Uh, but yeah, so if you add in like a feedback scheduler, um, like I'm doing here, um, You'd have to add in um, something so that you can detect from the command line that the um, um, that we selected that we wanted to run a simulation with a feedback scheduler and create an instance of your you know feedback scheduling policy or whatever policy you're implementing, right? Um, and it would be you'll you'll have to probably include the header file. 
for your new scheduler. Um, Um, you should update the documentation. Oh, well, I guess. Um, I guess it's kind of already in there, except for feedback. Um, but uh, yeah. Um, when you add the include file, it should. There it goes, yeah, it should recognize that the feedback scheduler policy is a, a class now that you can make a new instance of, so. Um, all right, so yeah, it's already a little bit longer. I really wanted to go here, so I'm gonna go ahead and wrap that up, uh, but that should be enough to get you started, um, um, including getting started on the second part here, right? So um, we can talk more about some of the details of, you know, how you might go about Im implementing, you know, HRRN or source process next or whatever you might be thinking of um, on Wednesday then. So, um, all right. So I'm going to go ahead and um, stop the recording here. And as usual, I'll post that. Um, and, you know, you guys can send questions. Those people that are online waiting for some questions can stick around. Um, but, um, yep, that's it. We'll see you guys later then.